This week, we're talking emojis with weather stations, Xbox and Andy Circus. If it feels like the weather is getting weirder, well, that's because it is. In many parts of the world, meteorological records seem to be tumbling virtually year after year. And as it gets more erratic and extreme, the need for accurate forecasts becomes vital. This is the BBC's Weather Centre at New Broadcasting House, and this is where they take their best guess at what the next few days are going to look like. We kind of take it for granted these days, but as you would expect, there's an awful lot of number crunching that goes on, which is what Ben is doing right now. Hi, Ben. Hi, Spencer. You recognise Ben, he's on the telly. <laughs> um, and Ben is taking raw data from the Met Office on this screen and turning it into something more akin to what we see on the TV. It all goes to make up that familiar weather map that we know and love. And for the UK, each four kilometer square gets its own individual forecast from the Met Office. Other services can provide an even more granular forecast. But swing around to Africa and it's a very different story. Here we're working at much lower resolution. The squares here are only 25 kilometers across. One of the reasons is because data is particularly thin on the ground here. Now, over the coming month or so, we're going to be looking at how technology is changing this continent. And to start our journey, Dan Simmons has travelled to Tanzania to meet a chap who used to work here, but who is now on a mission to improve the forecast for Africa. Sub-Saharan East Africa is lush. The soils are rich. It's the end of a very wet, rainy season. Too wet for some farmers who saw their crops rot. <laughs> Angus and Asher farm in Lushoto. They tell me climate change has made it difficult to predict the seasons. They've gone from drought to flood in recent years and lost harvests to both. <laughs> Next door, Peter's been planting Jessica, a type of runner bean, which can take as little as six weeks to grow. In September mm. to October, yeah. the, the rainfall are yeah. very harsh. It can rush the topsoil to be down there. But last season, he lost his entire crop to sudden, heavy, early rains. The farmers here know what they're doing. They just don't quite know anymore what the weather's up to. Former BBC weather presenter and keen gardener Peter Gibbs wants to do something about that and he's found a pretty neat way to explain it to me. I think you're going to like this guy. Great. The big reveal. <laughs> oh! Oh my word! Look at this! Is that grand or what? That is huge! That goes on forever, doesn't it? It just, yeah. I mean, th you know, this gives you some idea of the scale of Africa. I mean, the drop here is about a thousand metres right. from where we are. No, 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 no. Right. That, that's not... close enough, I think. <laughs> uh, from the west of Sambara Mountains, where we're standing, yep. down to the Maasai Plain. And we're looking at an area here of just hundreds of square kilometres. Lots of weather going on. You can see some clouds building over the, uh, the mountains in the distance. Most of it farmed as well. I can exactly. See. There's lots of people living out there. There's not one weather station anywhere that you can see. So how do you do a good forecast for here without that information? That's incredible. You know, back in the UK, you'd have, well, at least half a dozen, perhaps 15 weather stations in that same sort of area. So you can see the problem. So yeah. the satellites can't do it, because we have satellites, don't we? The satellites can do a bit of it. The satellites will be picking up those clouds we can see out there, mm. but they can only get an estimate of actually how much rain one of these shower clouds can actually produce. You need that information on the ground, actually measuring it, plus all the other parameters, things like temperature, humidity, air pressure. It, you know, it's like any sort of computer program, garbage in, garbage out. 
Peter's advising a startup called Kakua that wants to pepper Africa with these. Fully automated, self-reporting, low-cost weather stations. They can be monitored from anywhere, hooking up to Africa's extensive mobile cell network. Kakua placed their first station last year and will have more than 100 operating by Christmas. So what do we get on our fully automatic weather station? Well, uh, we've got a bucket up here which measures the rainfall. There's a little uh, seesaw device in there which goes backwards and forwards for every drip that comes through. That tells us how quickly the rain is falling as well as how much rain has fallen. An anemometer right at the top gives us the wind speed and the direction by the vane there at the very, very top. This is a solar panel which powers the whole thing. It also rather cleverly is used to tell us how much sunshine we're getting. Just behind it in this sort of hive kind of affair, this is the temperature gauge. It also measures humidity and it's stuck in there so that it can't be affected by direct sunlight or more heat coming from the ground, which is uh, dissipated by this housing. All of that data has to be collected by a panel round at the back, which is sent to this communications unit. It has a SIM card that works in every African country. What would some of us do for one of those? And then it uses this transmitter to send it all back to base. That goes back to Europe, and then from the guys in Europe, they will produce a model which will give people back here a more accurate weather forecast. It's already making a difference. Farmers like Peter get daily text alerts giving them a steer as to what to expect. And this farmer told us his texts have helped him decide when best to add fertilizer and pesticides. We can actually um, make a massive difference to the farmers themselves. I mean, up to 80% yield increases. That would be the difference between just eating to stay alive and sending your kids to school. And it's not just the personal impact. Health agencies can use improved forecasts to better predict outbreaks of malaria or cholera. And insurers want to know if they need to pay out on policies. This information gap is holding the continent back. The cocoa belt in West Africa is shifting. Multinationals want to know which way and by how much. And it'll be selling on the big data Kakua collect that'll help pay for what's looking like a pretty big job. Well, across the whole of Africa at the moment, there are around 500, just 500, reliable reporting weather stations. To get good coverage, you need to get up to something like 20,000. And from my point of view, you know, after 30 odd years in meteorology, it's fantastic for me personally that I feel I can make use of that experience to actually make a difference to people's lives here. That was Dan Simmons with Peter Gibbs in Tanzania, and we'll have more reports from the African continent later this month on Click. Microsoft boasts its new Xbox One X is the most powerful games console in the world. They've stopped short of calling it the most powerful console in the galaxy. I suspect they're saving that accolade for the machine that comes after this one. But there's good reason for all of this talk of power, and that is down to what lurks under the hood of this console. It has an 8-core processor running at 2.3 gigahertz, a 6 teraflop GPU, 12 gig of memory, and a 4K Blu-ray player thrown in for good measure. This means the machine can pump out 4K, 60 frames per second graphics in HDR. Stunning. What those numbers and specs mean is that this box is capable of producing much sharper, crisper and more detailed graphics than the old Xbox One S, which had a maximum resolution of 1080p, which is hmm, eye offending high definition, as it's now probably known. What it does mean is that there is an incredible level of detail in the graphics. Look at this Porsche that I'm driving in Forza. I've managed to crash it and scrape it a couple of times. And you can see every single dent and ding that I've put in the car, every single little bit of chipped paintwork. It really is very, very detailed. 
The One X can play games made for the older Xbox, but some titles will be enhanced, like Rise of the Tomb Raider here, which boasts upgraded 4K graphics and a higher frame rate, which makes everything look smoother. These enhancements won't be standardised though. Microsoft says it's up to developers how they choose to use the extra grunt the One X provides. This new visual virtuosity is great if you own a 4K TV. But if you're using an HD screen, the One X can give games a graphics boost as well, making them look better than they would on the old machine. But how do they achieve this? Witchcraft? Or more precisely, super sampling, a technique that allows all the detail and information in a 4K image to be scaled down to fit into a 1080p screen, which I suppose is a form of silicon sorcery. Apart from prettier visuals, the new machine should enjoy faster load times, and unlike its 4K console rival, the PS4 Pro, the One X has a 4K Blu-ray player fitted as well. So the box does more stuff than the PS4 Pro, but it's also more expensive than the PS4 Pro as well. Microsoft is keen to say that this is the world's most powerful console, but it's also the most expensive at £449. And I think that might be the biggest hurdle that the Xbox One X has to overcome, its price. And as the games the machine plays are essentially the same as those on its less powerful older sibling, the One S, this console is probably only going to appeal to those with spare cash burning a hole in their pocket and a 4K TV on which to watch the prettier pictures the machine produces. Well, that's cast rather a gloom of a thing, doesn't it, lads? What a drag he is! Hello and welcome to The Week in Tech. It's been a bad week for Tesla as they revealed their months behind schedule on production of their new Model 3. WhatsApp released a delete messages for everyone function, allowing users to finally retract comments after they've sent them. And Bitcoin went berserk, reaching a record high, with one Bitcoin now worth over £5,000, up 800% in the past year. Google, Facebook and Twitter faced a grilling this week from the US Congress about possible Russian influence in last year's American election. The tech firms had to explain why they failed to prevent political ads being published on their platforms bought with Russian money. Senators are now considering extending regulations found in TV, radio and newspapers to social media sites too. Now, are you sitting comfortably? Well, Ford's new robot certainly is. This contraption tests car seats by moving like a passenger getting in and out of a vehicle. It sits 25,000 times to create the same wear and tear as 10 years of use from your derriere. Poor chair. And Sony is teaching an old dog new tricks by bringing back the Ibo. The resurrected Robo pup comes complete with artificial intelligence, so it can learn what makes its owners happy. Although at a price of well over £1,000 and a monthly subscription plan of 20, smiles may be short lived. The original canine was canned 11 years ago to save the Japanese giant cash. Whether you love them or loathe them, it looks like emojis are here to stay. In fact, we'll probably be seeing even more of them soon. So, Laura Lewington has been investigating the future of emojis. In case you missed it, the new iPhones have been released this week. But whilst it may seem hard to comprehend how a phone can be worth over a grand, the iPhone X brings with it a quirky feature that possibly says a lot about the future of how we communicate. And emojis allow users to animate the facial expressions of a chosen emoji. It uses their phone's selfie camera and facial recognition technology to track over 50 muscle movements to create the appropriate expressions. And they're clearly not the only company thinking in pictures. Emoticons, emojis, animojis, bitmojis, actionmojis, thingmojis. OK, I made the last one up. 
But what's happened to good old-fashioned words? Every day, six billion emojis are used, but they've come a long way since these, which were created by a Japanese phone company in 1999. Apple now offers 190 new static emojis to satisfy your every pictorial need, including broccoli and a brontosaurus. Meanwhile, Apple and Google seem to be struggling over what order burger ingredients should be loaded in. Um, surely the meat at the bottom? And if you're having a spot of bother on Tinder, then now you could throw a virtual drink over someone. But while some gestures may be universally understood, not everybody interprets every picture in the same way. It's like a, a friendly kiss, like a... But That's we... whistling. That's whistling? Yeah. I think that's about confusion, actually. And that looks as if that emoji is pouting. OK, I can see that now, but can you just pout for me? Oh, uh, just a little cheeky kiss. OK. Slightly spaced out in a dream. A secret, or don't say anything. I've got nothing to say. That was a bit awkward. <laughs> Look what I just said. Keep an eye out, but there's two eyes. Keep eyes out. <laughs> So is facial recognition the future of the humble emoji? The team behind a new AI-powered social networking app called Polygram certainly hopes so. Let's see what the options are. That's pretty weird. Wow. This app also uses artificial intelligence to map a user's facial expressions via the selfie camera, allowing them to respond to posts with an animated emoji replicating their actual facial reaction. Meanwhile, Snapchat's action emojis launched a few months ago. For users who opt in, it'll combine their GPS location and their phone's accelerometer tracking how fast they're moving to guess what they're doing at that moment. And that will then be placed on what they call the Snap Map. There's even a film. The Emoji Movie grossed over $211 million worldwide. And, of course, there's a World Emoji Day. But depending on context, what seems like a harmless picture could cause offence, something Instagram is trying to overcome. Nearly half of posts and comments on the social network contain an emoji, so they've enlisted the help of some machine learning to identify context and block anything they believe to be offensive. That's not to say they can't provide a bit of fun. Now, this is a bit of a quiz. What film title do you think this spells out? Uh, the Lion King. Lion King. <laughs> Too easy. Apple time, peach time, clock apple. In French, it's orange mécanique. Clockwork orange. So maybe they will have the last word after all. Clockwork orange. Oh, that's amazing! Does this face look familiar? How about this one? These are some of the most iconic characters in modern cinema. All of them created using groundbreaking performance capture technology. And although they don't look it, they are all the same face. Andy Serkis is himself the world's most iconic performance capture actor. His latest role has involved breathing an astonishing amount of humanity into Caesar in War for the Planet of the Apes, and even led for calls for him to win the Oscar for Best Actor. His production company, The Imaginarium, is now venturing into video games with a release on the new Sony PS4 PlayLink platform that extends the world of the Planet of the Apes. It's a decision-based game that plays out more like a cross between a movie and a choose-your-own-adventure book. And it's here that I got to sit down with the man behind the mask. You kind of are the king of performance capture. Do you mind that? You know, you do other work, you've got a movie coming out this week that you've directed, you've got video games as well. I mean, do, do you mind the fact that people still... Why would I mind? I love it. I mean, it's the most brilliant, it's the most extraordinary uh, tool for the 21st century actor to be able to embody or play anything across multi-platforms. It's the end of typecasting. It's the most egalitarian form of acting because any actor can become a, a creature or a character, a humanoid or not, or inanimate and bring it a sentience and... Uh, existence. The art of transformation and becoming, for me, I mean the actors work in different ways, but the process of completely embodying another character was so 
uh, w w drove me as an actor, and that's what I love doing. And this is this technology allows you to do that to the nth degree. It's it's climbing deeply inside a character, being that character, and it can be as extreme as Gollum or King Kong or you know anything in between. You're him. You're Caesar. I fight only to protect apes. You can never quite tell what was tweaked in post-production. So is the performance that I'm looking at actually what they gave on the day, or did they just give it a, a tweak? Whereas when you're watching a, a real human do it, there's, there's less of that doubt. Well, but, but you know, if you look at modern filmmaking now, the, the amount of times that you, know, you can take a blink out that someone's done, you can add a tear if someone's supposed to be crying and they didn't manage to do it in the take. You know, yeah. you can, of course they do. Uh, uh, you know, augmentation of live action movies is the crossover between what you think you're seeing as being real and what, you know, is in, in this day and age, visual effects are in every single shot of every movie, apart from very low budget independent movies who can't afford visual effects. In, in Planet of the Apes, uh, when Matt Reeves is directing a scene between me and Woody Harrelson, um, he then takes our performance and, that, and my performance goes into the cut and he cuts it with Woody and there's the back and forth between us. That, that's what he lives with, and that's what the movie is screened as originally, before you even see the apes. Really? Uh, before you even see, and so then, the, so, so yeah, and, and, and they even start testing the movie with the actors' faces in. Because it's all got to live or die on the performance. You can't add the performance. That's not created after the fact. It's the manifestation of the performance after the fact, um, which is obviously an incredible visual effects artistry. Um, but no, but, the, but, but Matt lives with the cut of the entire movie, with us, you know, it's not Planet of the Apes, it's Planet of the Actors in mocap suits. Master looks after us now. Um, of all your performance capture roles, which stand out as something monumental happened here? So I, so I have a very soft spot for Gollum. And, um, but, but Caesar, you know, it's, there isn't, I don't think, I've tried to think if there's any other part that an actor has played where they played from, from birth all the way through to death. And actually not only just growing older, but evolving the character, evolving from being one thing into another. So becoming, going from pure chimpanzee to almost human. So the technology that allows any actor to do that is all right by me. <laughs>the legendary Andy Serkis. Just before we go, I wanted to remind you that we have a ton of click content running on our Facebook page throughout the week. Like this, where we showcased research from ETH Zurich in Switzerland, which built a curved concrete roof using new building techniques. Algorithmic calculations mean less concrete and fewer support structures are needed. The researchers say the manufacturing process uses a minimal amount of concrete and support structures, meaning less waste and reduced environmental impact. The whole prototype weighs 20 tonnes with just 800 kilograms of supporting cables and textile. I think with uh, resources disappearing uh, and uh, us having only one planet, we need to design better. And uh, as a structural designer, I care about, uh, about exactly that and also showing that actually we can make quite a big difference, that we can make exciting buildings that are not wasteful, but actually quite the opposite, that uh, do things much better, much thinner, much more integrated, um, uh, much more efficient. And you can see more short stories from the world of tech on our Facebook page and on Twitter at BBC Click. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon.